Okay, so I'm presenting the revised perspective text. Um, the revised perspective text, um, which is in bulletin number four. Um, it was revised by the last meeting of the NC, um, mainly to take into account the new developments around possibilities for um, far left unity, basically. Um, and I'm also introducing the resolution from the EC in Bulletin 6, um, which again addresses the issue of um, revolutionary unity, um, taking into account, because it was only adopted last week, taking into account the very up-to-date position following the meeting that we were invited to of the, uh, of, of the IS network um, last Saturday. Um, there will be there will be an amendment proposed to this, a Roy Walls amendment on Europe, um, um, which I, I, Roy isn't here, but I, I believe that that, um, that Fred Carpenter from London is going to introduce that. So obviously I I, I don't agree with that amendment because I agree with the document we've got in front of us. Okay, so um, it's. Um, the perspective text is, is a very comprehensive text, as comrades will know, um, and it's not possible for me here in 25 minutes to um, refer to everything that's in, in, in it. Um, and particularly given recent developments in terms of the possibilities of a broad party and the possibilities of, of, of far left unity, um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do in this presentation is to refer to what I think are the, the really the main things facing us over the next six months or the next year. That's what I'm going to I'm, I'm going to prioritise. So I'm therefore going to um, make some points about the following. Um, briefly on the global crisis, um, rather more on the crisis of the EU um, and the fight back across Europe, which is something that Joseph Maria from the Bureau We'll, we'll, we'll be saying more about when he makes his uh, introduction after lunch. Um, the struggle in Greece and the rise of Syriza. Um, the political situation in Britain. The struggle against austerity. Um, the developments on the left in recent months. And I'm going to present then what I think is like the five main tasks that are in front of us, therefore, over the coming year. The first is developing and deepening our eco-socialist conceptions. The second is fighting the cuts. The third is developing our feminist ideas and feminist conceptions. The fourth is the possibility of building a board party. And the fifth is the possibilities of revolutionary unity. I think those, those are the things uh, which, we're, which, we're, um, which we're facing um, over, the, over the coming months. Globally, we're now more than five years into the deepest recession since the 1930s, which remains completely unresolved and which is in fact now um, the longest uh, lasting such crisis in modern history. There appears to be agreement on the left these days in terms of the uh, of the character of the crisis at the economic level, that it's a, a, a system, a systemic system, a crisis of the capitalist system itself, and it's not some kind of uh, cyclical development or business cycle. Um, there's far less agreement, however, on uh, the the the. <laughs> The aspect of the crisis that we we stress, which is dual or the, the dual or multiple nature of the crisis. In other words, a crisis not only uh, of, of an, at the economic level, but at, at the at the level of the ecology of the planet. Um, this is this is a conception which is is either rejected or neglected by many sections of the left, and it's something that uh, that, that 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 we need to continue to fight for. Um, the, the evidence of it is overwhelming. Um, global warming is accelerating. 
The Arctic sea ice is retreating much faster than previous thought. Climate chaos and extreme weather events hit food production around the world. Floods, heat waves, droughts, fires, uh, and so on. Um, we're approaching tipping points that can make the whole uh, thing irreversible. And we have to continue to argue very strongly for this kind of understanding of the crisis. At the level of the EU, uh, the crisis was initially a product of the world crisis, but it's now the epicentre of it. And the depth of the crisis is, is reflected by the inability of the European elites to have any effect on its progress. In fact, endless EU summits uh, resol have resolved absolutely nothing. The EU is, is now wracked by internal divisions, firstly between the countries of the Eurozone and the rest, and secondly be between the countries of the centre and the so-called periphery. The Eurozone stands on the brink of further contagion, as illustrated by the remarkable crisis in Cyprus um, in, re in, in recent weeks, where the, the raiding of private bank accounts to pay off the debt will no doubt uh, put bank runs firmly on the agenda now when uh, other, other crises um, uh, occur. The most crisis-ridden co economies of the EU are being strangled by austerity programmes taken straight from the shock top, uh, doctrine tactics of uh, Milton Friedman himself. Social democracy has been completely complicit with this and has been unflinching in its support for austerity. In fact, there's not a, a, a single country in Europe where social democracy has uh, broken with the neoliberal agenda. And this includes France with the Hollande government and so on. The fight back across Europe um, has, and no doubt Joseph, Joseph Maria will say more about this as well, the fight back across Europe has been huge, but it's been uneven. The European Day of Action on November 14th saw millions take action in 24 countries across the EU. There were general strikes in Spain and Portugal. In Italy, there were demonstrations in 100 cities and four hours of strike action. In France, there was 130 strikes and protests in 100 cities. In Belgium, all transport services were brought to a halt. The centre of the resistance, of course, has been in Spain, Portugal and Greece. In Spain, we've seen the emergence of the indignados, general strikes and the, str and the, and the struggle of the miners in defence of their jobs. In Portugal, there have been general strikes and mass demonstrations, two of them involving 10% militant demonstrations involving 10% um, of, the, of the population. Greece, of course, was and is um, in the front line, both of the level of the scale of attack and of the resistance amount, uh, which has been mounted by the working class. Greek society has been smashed up. The state has practically collapsed. Public services are being wiped out. Its economy has been shrinking by 7% a year. There is 25% <coughs> unemployment and 50% amongst youth. Its debt, its debt is now 170% of, of its of GDP. And Greek society has been deeply polarised, of course, by the emergence of the fascist uh, New Dawn. But, it, but Greece, in fact, I think, I think we should say about Greece that actually the level of struggle mounted in Greece is, 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 is really the biggest level of struggle since the Portuguese Revolution of 1974. There have been over 20 general strikes. There have been hundreds of demonstrations and mobilisations. Uh, but in the end, it couldn't be won just at the uh, industrial level. What was posed was a political development in terms of uh, a workers' government of the anti-austerity parties. It was this which led to the rise of Syriza, a radical left party which came close to winning power last June. Syriza is the most significant development on the European left for many years. It was only stopped from forming a government by the sectarianism of other sections of the left. It went from 4% to 27% in, in the course of the crisis. It could easily win as and when 
uh, fresh elections are called and it could, uh, could uh, form an anti-austerity government. We therefore have, and we have to stress you know, the incredible importance of this, we have in Europe a radical left party with, which, is likely, which is likely to be elected into government with a huge confrontation with the bourgeoisie, not just in Greece, but the European elites and the bourgeoisie across <coughs> Europe. This is a major challenge uh, to the European left, uh, not just a challenge to replicate what has uh, happened in Greece in terms of the, uh, of, of the rise of Syriza, but a challenge in terms of the defence of Syriza, should Syriza come to office and be subject to a massive attack uh, from the uh, Greek and European bourgeoisie, which is, which is what would happen um, uh, in, in that case. And it's this really which makes uh, uh, Greek solidarity and the whole issue of Greek solidarity uh, incredibly important and it's important that we're involved in that. Then we come to Britain. Um, the level of struggle in Britain of course is much lower than, in, uh, uh, than in, in most European countries, or certainly the ones we've been talking about, um, <coughs> since um, we've yet to overcome the defeats of the 1980s. It has, however, uh, been um, an interesting week uh, over the last week and, and uh, in some ways quite remarkable. We've had the ruling class celebrating the life of a Tory leader who smashed the unions in the, in the 1980s. Uh, not, that it went in, not that it went entirely to plan. Their view of it was Churchill had a state funeral because he won the war, Thatcher could have a state funeral because she smashed the unions. <coughs> But what, in, what actually happened, as the comments will have seen, what actually happened is that it raised the whole issue of Thatcherism in a way that it's not been raised for a long time. So we have George Osborne saying, we're all Thatcherites now, and we have polls showing 60% of people rejecting Thatcherism, and we had a series of demonstrations and protests, uh, which, uh, which actually what it has done, in my view, it's actually uh, pinned Thatcherism firmly onto uh, the coalition uh, branded them with Thatcherism, which I think is, is not something which is going to help them uh, as they move towards uh, a new election. They are in any case, uh, they were in any case vulnerable, and I think this makes them more vulnerable. <coughs> They're facing a triple dip recession, the debt is going up and not down, they've lost their triple A credit uh, rating, and the Tories have a, a huge challenge to their right uh, electorally by U UKIP. <coughs> their response to the challenge from UKIP has to shift further to the right and to go on to the, to, to the xenophobic and the racist agenda, anti-immigrant agenda, uh, which we've seen um, in recent weeks, which has now reached um, grotesque proportions. They've never le nevertheless, they've been ramming through their cuts um, mainly because they haven't yet met serious opposition to reverse that. They're getting away with their cuts, in my view, because of four principal factors. They won the argument early on that there was no alternative to the cuts. They've had massive support from the media. Labour has been compromised right from the outset by its own cuts agenda and also its inability even to argue its own case. <laughs> The TUC and, and the major unions have been a disaster since a demonstration every 18 months and an occasional strike action was never going to uh, reverse the cuts. And I think that it's not to say, however, that it's easy to, uh, to develop um, uh, mass strike action after so many years in the doldrums, but the point is it is entirely possible, and it, but it's only possible um, if they put forward some determined leadership and stick to it and, develop, uh, and, and develop consciousness in the course of struggle. Labour, of course, has, has followed the Tories to the right. Everything they've, every time they've lurched to the right, Labour has followed. Every time they've, they've raised the issue of racism, uh, Labour has followed. Uh, nevertheless, it's probably the case that the most, at this stage, the most likely 
um, outcome of the next election is a Labour government, despite, despite uh, their, their policies and, and, and despite their performance. Uh, because, uh, because there is a rising level of resistance against the cuts. Um, the teaching unions and the civil service unions are getting together and planning strike action. Um, action at all levels against the cuts is hotting up, uh, particularly around the NHS. There have been serious mass, mass mobilisations in, in, in several parts of London, uh, Lewisham for example, and then D Birmingham and Newcastle and other, part, uh, other parts of the country. No doubt John will inform us in the course of the weekend uh, exactly where this has happened and, and, and what, and what ne needs to be done. Disabled people have been mobilising against the cuts and, and, and so on. The need, however, the problem, <coughs> however, is the unity or the disunity of the anti-cuts movement. Instead of having one anti-cuts movement, unfortunately, we have three anti-cuts movements. And this is a big problem. It's a problem, however, actually, that starts with the disunity of the far left and reflects itself in the anti-cuts movement. This is why I think when we look at possibilities of, uh, of developing left unity, uh, that I'm going to go on to talk about uh, shortly, this is not something which is just something for the, for the far left or just something for the left. What is involved is the unity of the whole movement uh, and the possibility of developing unity for, for the whole movement. So therefore, I want to, as I said, I want to present five points of policy which I think should be our priorities um, over, over the coming uh, year or so. The first is strengthening our eco-socialist conceptions. This is actually the political core of our politics. Our e eco-socialist orientation is now central to identity and a key factor in building the organisation and shaping our work. Eco-socialism is a declaration that the designation socialist is no longer adequate. That the ecological issues cannot for us be an add-on, but are central to everything we do, a fundamental component of our programmatic identity. It is a signal that we reject the capitalist logic of insatiable growth, uh, which is built into the nature of the system. It means so striving for a society based on ecological rationality, democratic control, social equality, and the pre predominance of use values over exchange values. The primary aim of, a, of an eco-socialist government should be for growth in the quality of life rather than in the quantity of output, for an abundance of free time rather than an abundance of unnecessary commodities. This, uh, this um, development of our eco-socialist ideas has led us in recent years uh, to a close relationship um, with the comrades of the Green Left. We've been working with them both at practical and uh, a, a political level. We've been working with them in the, in, in the ecology campaigns, the campaign against climate change, the campaign against climate change trade union committee, um, and now increasingly, well, we also work with them in core, uh, but now increasingly around the anti-fracking campaigns which are becoming increasingly central to the whole uh, struggle for, for, uh, to defend the environment. We're also <coughs> working with them, um, we've met them very recently, they've begun to produce a paper, uh, a, broad, a broad paper called the Eco-Socialist, um, which they're producing a, a second edition um, uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the People's Assembly uh, event uh, in June. And we're working with them on that and sort of jointly, jointly producing a paper with them on that. And they, they, share, they share our alternative to the crisis. And that is that, uh, that, that uh, not, it's not only a matter of rejecting austerity, but it's a matter of advocating um, a massive programs of investment uh, based on uh, uh, green energy and, and to create uh, a, a, different, a different form of society and uh, uh, away from uh, fossil fuel and, a and in particular a campaign for the million uh, climate jobs. 
uh, which the campaign against climate change campaigns around, and its trade union committee, and um, which we've been strongly in support. So that's the first one, uh, eco-socialism. The second um, is feminism. Um, when we planned this conference agenda back in November and December of last year, um, we put feminism on the agenda for two uh, principal reasons. One, because of the onslaught that women are facing um, in terms of the cuts and to, uh, to advance that whole discussion. But secondly, um, because uh, we have an, an unacceptable gender balance in the organisation which has to be seriously tackled. Um, it's gender balance that goes back into, into periods when the organisation or its predecessors have gone through very difficult times and then uh, when, when better times and new opportunities come, it doesn't automatically redress itself. It has to be, it has to be fought for in, in, in order to redress itself. But then, no sooner we started the pre-conference discussion than we had um, the huge uh, developments um, inside the Socialist Workers' Party. Um, on the one hand, the Socialist Party going into steep decline, uh, and the other, that it went is going into steep decline around key issues of the defence of women in the organisation and uh, attacks by the leadership on feminism uh, and raising the whole issue of feminism in the workers' movement and the left in a way which it, it, hasn't, been, it hasn't been raised uh, for a long time. Um, and so this, this brought a whole new importance to uh, this item uh, on the agenda. Uh, and had we not had it on the agenda, no doubt we would have to have had second thoughts and, and, and change, the, the, change the agenda. But we have, and tomorrow uh, we have a full discussion uh, on, on feminism and how to respond to all this and how to bring women into the organisation and, and all that. But it does raise, it links into this whole issue of, uh, of democracy on the left, um, um, which has been raised by the comrades of the anti-capitalist initiative. Because you can have, you can have a position, you, you can have constitutional positions uh, in your constitution, which look there, they, they appear to be just there for the principle over the years, but suddenly something happens and they become absolutely crucial. Um, and uh, and now, rather than just defending that we have to have a uh, we have to have a feminised uh, constitution uh, for the organisation, we now face it. It isn't even <coughs> even feminised enough. You know, the whole situation can change uh, very rapidly um, on these things. So, um, so this, this, is, this is an extremely important uh, discussion now that we're, we're having tomorrow. Then there's the issue of fighting the cuts. And in terms of activity, of course, the fighting, fighting the cuts is our over, overarching priority. Core is by far the most open and credible of the campaigns and the one which, uh, which mo most expresses uh, the, the unity of the movement. Um, the People's Assembly, uh, in June, uh, really could hardly, I mean, I'm not saying particularly planned this way, but it could hardly have come at a better time because it comes with rising resistance against the cuts and it has the ability to draw all these threads together and to, uh, and, and to create something new going forward uh, after, after the People's Assembly. Um, it's, um, it's already um, oversubscribed, or it, it's heading to being oversubscribed. It's in Central Hall, Westminster, which holds 2,200. There are already 1,500 registrations two months in advance and going up rapidly. And they are booking um, um, <coughs> overflow venues and a marquee in the front and all things like this. There is going to be a very, very big response to it. Uh, and we need to back it to the full, mobilize every possible person we can along to it, and everybody should be signing up to it. Um, it has the support of virtually all of the trade unions, which is very important. Um, there is a danger that comes with that, that you can have too many general secretaries 
and so on, and we should argue not to have too many general secretaries, and we should argue for the centrality of the campaigns on the ground uh, in the conference. And uh, comrades that are closely involved in that could say what kind of headway is being made in that regard. But that should be entirely possible. Also, what comes out of it in terms of proposals, national demonstrations, moves towards unity, uh, all these things are, are extremely important in, in terms of, uh, of, of fighting the cuts. So this is a major priority. Um, building a broad party. Um, the gap to the left of Labour remains huge. The crisis of working class representation remains unresolved. Um, we've had bad experiences in the past which are, which is, which, in which the whole thing has founded in, in, terms of, in terms of Britain. But we've continued, as SR, we've continued to, to be absolutely committed to uh, the necessity for a broad party. Uh, the far left, the, the Marxists, can't, can't just do it on their own. We need a, a broader expression in order to, uh, to, to have the weight which is necessary in order to uh, influence, influence events. We've been through the Socialist Alliance and we've been through Respect. Um, we've held seminars, we've written books, we've, we've, we've had meetings, uh, all, to, all to, uh, to keep to the forefront as much as we possibly can uh, the issue of building a broad party uh, of, of the left. Um, going back two months, it looked an incredibly uphill struggle. Um, we campaigned on it, we argued for it, we theorised around it, but we didn't know where it was going to come from. That was the reality of it um, a very short time ago. And then we had... Um, uh, we had Left Unity uh, was set up by Kate Hudson and others, uh, Andrew Bergen and others, and uh, just to, and the first, we, we went to the first meeting and they said at the first meeting, um, this is a long shot, we think there might be, I don't know what it was, it was one in a hundred or two in a hundred chances of this being successful, but we think we have to try. By the third meeting, Ken Loach had emerged with his new film, The Spirit of 45, and had put forward a call for uh, an appeal for people to sign up for a new party of the left. And within two weeks, 8,000 8, people had signed up. It was, it was, it was a completely unpredictable uh, situation. Um, and it's real. Um, not all the 8,000, of course, but nevertheless, there are now 90 proto groups. Uh, many of them are meeting with new people at them. Uh, good attendances, good gender balance actually, I've, I've, I've heard in terms of a lot, lot of these meetings. Um, and, um, and this has opened up a completely new situation in terms of the possibility of a board party in England or England or Wales. A completely new, completely new opportunity. And there's already a remarkable degree of agreement amongst, the, amongst those most involved into what shape such a party should be. First of all, it should be a party. Second, that it should be a membership-based party and not some kind of federal, some kind of federal federal arrangement. And also, because of the strength of the response, it's going forward very fast. <coughs> I understand that the meetings in the last few days have set up a timetable for a, a national meeting of the groups, which is happening shortly, another national meeting of the groups, which will, which will happen in September, uh, that will be charged with setting out the timetable for a founding conference of a new, of a new party in something like February. Uh, it's also proposing setting up a series of policy forums, uh, maybe we should use a different name <laughs> to that, <laughs> uh, but <coughs> policy groups to, uh, to um, uh, to de develop policy for a new party, this is this is serious. This is seriously going to happen, um, and uh, and we need to be absolutely 100% behind it. And finally, there is the issue. Uh, there, there, there is the issue of uh, revolutionary unity, which has been uh, brought up. Um, first of all, as I've said, first of all by uh, the, the uh, comrades of the anti-capitalist initiative. Um, who I've seen are now here with us, um, who um, not only broke with their tradition on, on, on a, a trajectory towards we, we need you know, a, more, a more 
um, transparent and democratic way of doing far left politics, but wrote a book about it, wrote articles about it, we've done joint meetings with them about it, and they opened up um, an incredibly important uh, discussion on the far left about an alternative way of organising the far left. Now we can have, we, we maybe have different views on, on the demise or what could well be the demise of the Socialist Workers' Party. Um, it's sort of a contradictory situation. It's never, it, it never, never in the left's interest when a major organisation uh, declines in that way. Fact is, it's happening and there's another side to it, and that is that, uh, that, that we've had uh, the emergence of the IS network, uh, which uh, has now uh, taken up this same theme that the Comrades of the Anti-Capitalist Initiative be taken up of how should we do far-left politics and how can we do a different far-left politics. And uh, you will have seen the report that either Adam and myself and Rafif uh, went to their conference last weekend, at their first meeting last weekend, having come out of the SWP, and it was really quite remarkable because here, here, was, here was Conway's looking outwards, not inwards, and saying, yes, we're going to build a network, we have to consolidate ourselves to build a network, but for the purpose of looking towards revolutionary regroupment with others. It's incredibly important. And actually, the two, the two others that were mentioned in their resolution was us as socialist resistance and the anti-capitalist network. And we're also all working inside left unity. They fully support left unity. We support left unity. Anti-capitalist network we support left unity. Now, if you take this forward the stage further, and I'm a little bit reluctant, you know, to... Uh, so talk about how, how far forward you go in these things because, you know, there's lots of things that can happen and the ability of the far left in Britain to, to uh, mess things up, you know, is, is, is legion. Um, ne never the, nevertheless, if you look at what could be shaping up here, and we have to talk about it because it's a real possibility, and that is that you could have, by early next year, um, a, a new board party has been launched which is open, inclusive and democratic, uh, with the possibility of existing within it um, a Marxist current platform or whatever involving, uh, involving uh, the, the, the different currents that, that I've been talking about. This, 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 at, least, at, least, at least this is now a real possibility that can be talked about. And this is incredibly important. So uh, I think that it's these things um, which, um, which marks out what we're going to do, uh, do next year. And I think that from our point of view, we've got to make sure that we make our contribution to this and that if it doesn't happen, uh, we, we will have done every possible thing we, do, we could have done to make it happen. Thank you very much, Ellen.